Hello. Today we are going to discuss H2O, water, okay? I mean, it's the basis of this whole class, right? Um, well, if it was just water and nothing in it, that'd be pretty boring. So we also are concerned with the things that are inside the water, which we're going to talk a little bit about today, but mostly chemically speaking for now to start. And we'll get to the life later, don't worry, and how all of that relates uh, e ecologically and relationships with uh, different organisms and uh, how they relate to us as far as the ocean. Because you know, remember, our planet is covered with 75% of this, okay? So I always like to say, um, if we were flying through space and um, we discovered this planet, um, we probably, today, we probably would have called it ocean instead of Earth. Because, you know, Earth is where we walk, and, but most of the planets, are, it's an ocean planet, right? It's mostly covered by water. So, had we been like dolphin creatures and developed into water like that, um, we would definitely, dolphins probably call their planet ocean, you know? They don't call their, they don't call our planet Earth where the land is. That's kind of biased, right? So anyway, let's talk about water, okay? Speaking of water, so you had a bellwork question. Um, hopefully you answered it already. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with this, um, this very famous quote from the rhyme of the ancient mariner. It's just a piece of that um, piece of work by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. And it's pretty obvious what he was referring to in that um, reference, which is it's salt water. You can't drink it. Okay, so how the notes work, um, at least for now, is that they go through the different sections in the textbook, okay? Because we are going to cover the entire textbook between now and the end of next, you know, end of, or April, I should say. So, um, so 1.11, 1.1.1 um, says, explain the changes <clears throat> in state of water. This is very basic. It's going to get a little more complicated as we go through. So, um, between solid, liquid, and gas in terms of kinetic particle Theory. Now, kinetic particle theory, if you took physical science, and if you're a freshman in eighth grade, you must know what I'm talking about. And if you're an upperclassman um, or, you know, 10th and above, you took physical science in ninth grade. So this is like some base, very basic stuff. We, do, we know that temperature is the measure of the motion of the particles, how fast, you know, they're going. And in solids, obviously, they're just vibrating like this, okay? Um, in liquids, they're moving, sliding past one another. They have a little more kinetic energy, motion. And then, of course, in gases, they're, you know, bing, bing, bing. They're everywhere, okay? All over the walls and all over everything. Bouncing off of each other and bouncing off of everything they can touch. So, obviously, solid would therefore have the least kinetic energy. Um, liquid would have more than a solid. And gas would have the most kinetic energy. Now, we're not going to talk about plasma, the fourth state of matter, as some of you, your minds may have went there. Um, you're not going to find plasma in the ocean, so we're not going to talk about plasma. Um, however, plasma is very prevalent in the environment because the sun is a big ball of plasma. Um, it's a big ball of energized gas. So, um, but there's also plasma much closer. If you look up in the ceiling, uh, those lights, um, well, at least historically, fluorescent light bulbs are plasma. These might be LED. I'm not quite sure. Um, but typically, those long bulbs, those fluorescent light bulbs, that's plasma energy when you turn them on. So temperature, again, I said, is the measure of kinetic energy of all the molecules. And when you increase the kinetic energy of the molecules, you get something called a phase change. And you, that's a change between the different states of matter. And in physical science, and, and certainly if you are, have taken chemistry or are going to take chemistry, you're going to know about the, the phase diagrams that have plateaus, and they have, um, depending upon whether you're adding energy or taking away energy, you're going to see uh, a different 
variation of that phase diagram. That just shows the different states of matter and the temperature changes as it's going through, okay? Evaporation is in here because um, liquid will turn into a gas without adding too much extra energy. At the, how did that happen? At the, um, at the surface of the liquid, so the surface of this water back here, some particles just kind of hit that perfect speed and they just fly off into the air and that's evaporation, okay? They don't need to have any like, they don't need to be put in a pot and the flame turned on and boiled to turn into a gas. A uh, large volume, yes, but not a, you know, a small volume. So if you just left a glass of water out, it would slowly evaporate into the atmosphere. Some of the particles would just get just enough speed to break the surface and go out as a gas. It's pretty wild. And so, of course, when you're beating the sun down on the ocean, that's going to happen at an increased rate because you're adding more energy to those surface particles. Okay, 1.12. And again, this is just part of the lesson. Other parts include uh, lessons out of the textbook, out of the workbook, and then um, some other alternative things that we're going to do in class for, to cover some of the more advanced things, not, not really the basic stuff. So describe the structure of the atom. Again, a review, a basic review of um, physical science. So I won't mention that anymore. So you know we have the nucleus, right? And the nucleus has shells or energy levels surrounding it. Um, and on those, and in the nucleus, you've got the uh, neutrons and the protons. The neutrons are neutral and the protons are positive. And then you have the electrons on those energy shells orbiting in what's called an electron cloud. This is a two-dimensional version. This is obviously not the way the universe works. The universe is three-dimensional, so this would be spherical, and these electrons would be traveling in and out of the board, and this would be a, a, you know, a ball like that. And so here's, an ex here's a specific example of two, well that's lithium, this is another specific example, um, carbon. Most organisms, all organisms really, that we know of are carbon-based uh, life forms. So if you took all the water out of us, for example, about 70% water, the most, the majority of the remainder would be the element carbon, okay? And um, just really simply organized, really. Well, if you take chemistry, you're going to realize it's not quite that simple with the electron orbits, but we don't have to worry about that in here, all right? Okay, so 1.13, understand that seawater is a mixture of different elements and compounds. I mean, we know this. We've been to the beach. We have tasted seawater. We know that it is not fresh. It is not what comes out of the tap. Even tap water is not perfectly fresh, right? Uh, even spring, spring water, like from Zephyr Hills in Florida and other places, is not entirely water. There's other things dissolved in the water, and that is what salinity is. What is the salinity of the water? You're talking about what is the concentration of all of those dissolved solids, like salts, and even gases that are um, in the water, okay? So, and around the world, depending upon what body of water you're in, you're going to get different um, concentrations of these dissolved substances. And it all depends on whether there's um, lots of evaporation, like at the equator, or lots of uh, inflow from melting uh, land ice, or um, like, like land glaciers, or rivers, okay? Like the Mississippi River, or places here in Florida, like um, the St. John's River. Well, actually, that flows north into Georgia. But um, the Loxahatchee River, which is just north of here. And the Everglades, of course, um, flowing down into the Keys. Okay? So we have done an, ex uh, an activity already over the past couple of days showing, um, talking about, discussing, and, and graphing for specifically these major solutes, these major dissolved solids, salts, in the, or ions, I should say, ions, in the sea. And here are the uh, parts per thousand. We're going to talk more about this later. Here's a very good pie chart showing that chlorine is obviously the winner here, the maximum. And then you've got sodium followed by um, 
sulfur and then magnesium and calcium and potassium and other minor elements and there's some of the other um, ones here like uh, bicarbonate um, and bromide nitrate okay silica iron um, they're all there's even gold floating around in water and seawater quite a lot actually but it's you know microscopic you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to go in the water and pick out some gold and, you know, make myself a necklace. That, you can't do that. Um, I always thought that somebody become, could become quite a millionaire if they could figure out how to make some sort of device or something that you put in the water and it attracts only gold molecule, or gold atoms, you know, uh, only atoms of a certain number of protons on the periodic table, you know, gold. I think it's like 79 or something like that. Uh, and and then you come back a month later and you know it's got gold collected in it. That'd be pretty cool. Think about that. Brainstorm that. You'll become a millionaire. Don't tell anybody about it because then everybody would be rich. Um, so the next one is describing the covalent bonding of the water molecule, and we're going to compare that to the hydrogen bonding that connects water molecules to other water molecules. It makes water sticky. So. Um, but the molecule itself is held together, you know, one oxygen and, and two hydrogens, um, which uh, is held together by a covalent bond. So a covalent bond is sharing of electrons, not a giving and a taking. That's ionic, if you recall. Um, salt, all salts are ionic, but water is covalent, okay? And um, oxygen has six valence electrons, each of the hydrogens has one valence electron, so when they get put together, they make that octet, that stable um, um, eight count for oxygen of electrons, which makes it no longer reactive. So non-reactive that we drink it, and we swim in it, and it's 70% of us, and firefighters use it to put fires out, and it's rather miraculous that you can take oxygen, which is explosive, by itself, right? If I had um, this marine science book on fire, if I just lit the corner on fire and I threw it into a container of oxygen or a room full of pure oxygen, this book would explode into flame so fast it would be gone and everything around would, the oxygen would just spread, the fire would spread everywhere because oxygen supports combustion. And then hydrogen is a flammable gas too. I don't know if you ever heard the story of um, the Hindenburg, the German blimp that blew up back in the 1920s or something like that in New Jersey when it was landing um, because all the hydrogen caught on fire inside. So hydrogen is explosive, flammable gas. But you put them together with covalent bonds where the electrons share and become that stable octet and the molecule changes identity really all over, right? And it just becomes this miracle that supports life. It's just quite amazing, quite amazing. So the next section of uh, part one of unit one is to identify um, these five, one, two, three, four, five, six, six um, different molecules. So you have to be so good at identifying them that you just see the number of um, electrons um, and the types of atoms and you can instantly tell the name. Now water is the easiest one, it's Mickey Mouse, right? It's a hidden Mickey right there. Um, and um, it's bent, you know, it's that V shape, okay? So that one's always easy to tell. One oxygen, two hydrogens, okay? Then you've got carbon dioxide uh, here, sorry. One carbon, carbon dioxide, di meaning two oxygens, carbon dioxide, and that's not bent like water, it's linear. So uh, and it's got two double bonds to make stable octets so that carbon dioxide, which I'm breathing out of my mouth right now, and what you're breathing out right now, um, is rather stable. As a matter of fact, carbon dioxide, I mean, it puts out fires. It's so stable, you know, just like water. Um, and um, then we have um, oxygen. Yes, oxygen. So we have two oxygens. Oxygen is a, a diatomic molecule, meaning that it exists with two of the same atoms connected together, covalently bonded, um, and sharing their electrons so that they have a stable octet, okay? 
Sulfur dioxide is kind of like, it's, it's definitely natural, but it's made through burning fossil fuels as well. And that's uh, not good for the environment, obviously, but it's also naturally occurring through something called a hydrothermal vent, which is um, hot mineral rich water. We'll learn more about it when we talk about environments and things, but coming out of like volcanic regions in the bottom of the sea. And then volcanoes proper, okay? There's lots of underwater volcanoes. There's actually an underwater vo water volcano right down in the Caribbean, just south of us in the West Indies. Um, it's got a really funny name. It's called the Kick'em Jenny volcano. Kick, like kick him, to kick him, kick him Jenny. That's, I don't know where, the Caribbean, crazy names down there, but fun, right? So um, sulfur dioxide comes from places like that, but it gets dissolved in the sea. It gets dissolved in the ocean. Sulfur, one sulfur, dioxide, two oxygens. It's actually kind of easy. And then of course we have glucose. Um, glucose, you, if you took biology, you are familiar with that. Um, but of course you learned about glucose in middle school as well. So, or in chemistry. And glucose is a ring of carbons with some extra things on the outside. Or sometimes it's drawn like this as a chain, but this is its natural form, glucose. Glucose is the sugar that um, plants make, okay? Um, and it's, you know, forms the basis of the food chain, not quite the bottom, that's like bacteria and stuff, but when you talk about plants and marine plants in particular, like uh, sea grasses and, and true true marine plants, not seaweeds, but they will also they're also photosynthetic, so they're also producing uh, glucose um, and, so, and a lot of marine algae as well. Seaweed is an algae, but that's a macro algae. Most of the algae in the water is um, is microscopic, planktonic, and you know most people think that we get all of our oxygen from plants. The majority. We actually get the majority, or at least half, of the oxygen that we breathe from the ocean, from photosynthetic um, microscopic algae. It's pretty wild. Um, and so they all, they're, all, they're all making this basic chemical that, you know, for life called glucose. If you put two glucoses together, two of these together, you get something called sucrose, which is table sugar. Um, which, you know, granular sugar, which is in all your soda and, and cakes and things like that, put on your cereal. And then if you put a bunch of the chains together, you get something called starch, which is in vegetables and breads and wheats and things. Um, and then if you put even more of those glucose molecules together, you get cellulose, which is wood, which is some of you are sitting on a wood chair. So that's the same thing. It's pretty amazing how all this biochemistry works. So you have to be familiar with those. You have to be able to identify those just by looking at the chemical structure, okay? All right, um, the next one is, uh, there's only, um, this is, we're on slide seven, so there's only 15 slides in this first half of water. So we're not gonna, you know, take the whole, we shouldn't have to take the whole class period for this, we'll see. Let's see where it goes. Um, Again, you have to discuss ionic bonding and what's happening in this diagram with sodium chloride. So I'm gonna step away for a minute so you can really get a picture of this. I put this in your notes so you can get, a, uh, so you can really understand what's happening here. You might wanna draw or take some notes here, but here we have sodium, which is on the periodic table, so is chlorine. They're on opposite ends. One is um, an, an anion, and one is a cation, okay? So the cation is positive and the anion is negative. And they will be attracting each other, just like a, the positive end of a magnet attracts the negative end of another magnet, okay? And this is not covalent. This is not a sharing of electrons. This is ionic, okay? This is ionic bonding. So they're gonna, one of them is gonna give an electron to the other one, and the other one is going to take the electron from it so that they can have stable octets. So you see here, uh, 281, that's the orientation of electrons in sodium. So, but there's an extra one there, that one, and that's making sodium very angry, okay, to anthropomorphize 
to put human feelings onto it. Um, and chlorine has seven in its outer energy level, its valence electron level, not eight. And it, they both want eight, okay? So all sodium has to do is give its electron to chlorine, making now its outer orbit eight. So it gets rid of that one. And chlorine now makes its outer energy level from seven to eight and they're both extremely happy and stable. So stable that you can sprinkle this stuff on your french fries. And it, I mean, yeah, too much sodium is bad for your body, but separately, so just like water has separate um, characteristics when, the, when you break it apart, okay? Sodium is a metal that you can cut with a butter knife. It's extremely soft, and if you put it in water, Boom, it blows up. Chlorine, deadly green gas. Two lungfuls of chlorine and chlorine gas and your lungs stop working. You die, you fall on the floor and you die. Two extremely hazardous chemicals, but you chemically bond them by switching one, one electron from, from the sodium to the chlorine, making this one positive because electrons are negative. So you, um, if you take something negative away, you make it positive, right? So making sodium positive and chlorine negative, you're adding a negative, right? And, and making salt, a kind of salt called sodium chloride. There's all different kinds of salts, which we're gonna learn about in these notes, okay? So again, that's kind of like, to me, that's a miracle of nature. It's really, really cool stuff. And then of course, um, you would have to buy their diagrams you would have to identify these, just like you have to do with the uh, covalent ones, identify sodium chloride and calcium carbonate by their um, ch chemical structures, okay, and chemical names. So sodium chloride, this is just a, you know, like a blown up uh, animated version of a, a, a little cube, a little grain of salt that you would maybe put on your french fries, okay? So if you zoom in really, 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 really close, um, you'd be able to make out the, the um, atoms. We can't do this, so sodium chloride's too small. We can do it for larger things like gold. We can actually see gold atoms, it's really neat. Um, when they figured it out, like, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, it was on the cover of a whole bunch of magazines. They finally had the technology to zoom in to see particular atoms, but these atoms are too small. So this is just a, you know, representation of how they line themselves up in a crystalline structure. And then here's calcium carbonate, which is very, prevalent in the sea and very important for um, organisms like snails and um, crabs and, 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 and corals in making their shells. So, you know, I have a whole bunch of samples over there, but this um, snail shell, okay, is uh, the main ingredient here is calcium carbonate. And that's dissolved in the ocean, because if it wasn't dissolved in the ocean, then how would these organisms be able to pull it out of the ocean and make their homes, okay? So calcium carbonate is very important. It's one calcium cation with a charge of plus two, and the carbonate um, polyatomic um, molecule of a charge of two minus. And so it's just CaCO3. <clears throat> CaCO3, okay? And this is kind of what they look like in real life, not molecular form. So you have to know these chemical uh, names, uh, you know, formulas for these three salts. You're kind of lucky that it's not more, but because there are more out there, but um, sodium chloride, sodium and chlorine, sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate. This is the metal magnesium, which you can light on fire. There's probably some here at school. You just take a lighter and you can light, it's bright like a, like a flare, you know, like a road flare or firework. Um, bright white burns, but chemically bonded to the sulfate and you get um, Epsom salt, which you can buy at Publix or Walgreens and you can soak your swollen feet in it. Pretty wild stuff. Um, and then calcium carbonate, which we just talked about, and calcium carbonate looks like white powder if you were to buy some for one reason or another. Sometimes um, people sprinkle it like on their chickens to give their chickens some calcium so the eggs are harder. Okay, I don't know. So 
Here's some sodium chloride that has uh, um, evaporated out of the water and made growths of crystals along the edge of probably, this is probably the Dead Sea in the Middle East. So, and you're familiar with table salt, obviously, sodium chloride, you're familiar with that. Gosh, I hope so. And um, here are some organisms that need calcium carbonate to survive, corals, shellfish, like oysters and mussels and clams, um, fish bones, fish need calcium, right? Just like we do. Red seaweed, this grows down in the Keys. This stuff's amazing. When I went to sea camp down there with my marine biology students, like a long time ago, um, we collected this from the water and it's uh, hard it's seaweed. It's got, like, it's got a calcium carbonate kind of like um, structure to it a little bit. And all these creatures were living inside. It was quite amazing. And then of course, crustacean shells like lobsters, crabs, shrimp, those kind of guys. Oh, and even the little inside of a squid is something called a pen shell, pen like you write with but it's this clear, almost looks like a piece of plastic. And um, so these are all the organisms that um, you can get calcium, calcium carbonate from as a source, but also that need it, that pull it out of the water. And when they die, they, you know, the cycle. Plus some of it washes in from the land when it, when it rains. Okay, we're on slide 11. We only have uh, four slides left after that and we are done. So, Hydrogen bonds. All right, so we know that the water molecule is put together itself. The, the two hydrogens and the one oxygen are, are you know, bound um, with covalent attraction, sharing of electrons. But now let's talk about how water, like if I were to take my water here and, and move it around, you could see that drops of the water were stick to the side. Okay, so what, what makes water so sticky? When you get out of the shower or the swimming pool or the beach, you're wet. Why doesn't it just roll off like a duck's back, okay? Or, you know, some other waterproof thing. Um, and that's because of hydrogen bonding. So the hydrogen bonds are, exist because of the polarity of water. Water has one side that's a little negative, that's the oxygen side, and one side that's a little positive, that's the hydrogen side. So you can see here, the negative side is the oxygen and the positive side is the hydrogen. And so the hydrogen will stick to, not to other hydrogens, because just like um, magnets, likes repel and opposites attract, right? Same thing here. It's the same electromagnetic attraction between uh, two things. So the hydrogen won't stick to a hydrogen, but the hydrogen will stick to an oxygen and that one to that oxygen and so on and so forth until you get these hydrogen bonds um, making water stick to water and to other things. Okay. And um, so in ice, the hydrogen bonds are very stable and they make this crystalline structure. It actually forms so that it pushes the salt out. The crystalline structure of ice pushes the salt out and leaves empty space in here. That's why ice becomes less dense and floats. It's the only thing that does it. Another miracle of water. Otherwise, we'll talk about this next time, uh, but otherwise all life on earth would, would not exist if it wasn't for that odd behavior of water, odd property of water. And so, um, you know, they're stable. You can, you can try to break a piece of ice with your hand, it's not gonna work, you know, ice cube, okay? But wa the liquid water, of course, they're constantly moving around because they have more energy, right? They have more kinetic energy, going back to that first slide. So they're going to move around and slide, and slide past one another and hydrogen bonds, because they're weaker bonds than covalent bonds, are gonna break and reform constantly, okay? And then, of course, whenever you have um, a gas, like a steam, or the, the moisture that's in this air right now, or the moisture that's coming out of you know, your, your body when you breathe, that's got so much kinetic energy that the hydrogen bonds just fail to form. The kinetic energy overcomes the hydrogen bonds. And so here's the two uh, comparison with them. So you can see covalent bonds are internal. Covalent bonds are shared electrons. 
here, this is not an electron reaction. Electron reactions are chemical reactions. This is a kind of a physical reaction, okay? Um, keep bumping it with my shirt, I guess. Um, so you're getting um, an external attraction. All right. <clears throat> I think that, that's in your notes. Okay, this is a very wordy uh, section of the unit, okay? 1.1.10. So how does hydrogen bonding affect the other properties of water that we need to be familiar with, okay? Like um, limited solvent action, density, and specific heat capacity. So there is a, uh, a part of your notes right now that talks about, um, I think, four of these numbers. So you are supposed to um, just give me a little, uh, little information on each of those as I'm talking about this, okay? So limited solvent action. Well, we know that water is a universal solvent. That means that it dissolves a lot of things. Not everything. It doesn't dissolve sand, for example. Otherwise, there'd be no land. You'd walk on the beach and there'd be no beach. It would just be rocks or whatever and dirt and then water because the sand all dissolved, which is a good thing that water can't do that. Nor can it dissolve um, fats and oils, okay? It won't dissolve in it. So it has a limitation, which is good. Um, it also has um, a limitation in its polarity versus non-polarity um, dissolving things. So it's polar, so it's going to dissolve polar things, including gases. Non-polar things it has a, a, a hard a challenge with. Now, that's fats and oils, but also carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a lot more soluble than oxygen in the water because um, it's, sorry, then ox, yeah, oxygen, then the water. I said it right the first time. Because it's more polar than oxygen. Carbon dioxide is 200 times more soluble than oxygen because it's more polar. The water is more attracted to the polarity of the carbon dioxide than it is the oxygen. So just like um, it can dissolve things like salt and sugar because they are polar, um, it's going to dissolve carbon dioxide more. So in water, in a specimen of water where fish live, there's gonna be a higher concentration of carbon dioxide than there is gonna be oxygen. That's a very important factor, okay? And of course, um, you have to know, we're gonna talk more about this in the future uh, on the next part of these notes, but the solubility decreases as temperature goes up. So if I heat um, some water, if I heat some water, it's gonna drive the gases out. I don't mean bubbling, boiling. The boiling of water on a stove top is totally different. That is um, water vapor. Those bubbles are water vapor, not oxygen and carbon dioxide, no. Think about a, a pond, or, or let's do marine, um, a, um, a tidal pool. Okay, where the tide goes out and it leaves water and some rocks and some organisms like snails and octopuses and whatever else, might little tiny fish and seaweed and things might still be living in that until the tide comes back up again. That's called a tidal pool. And as the sun heats up that tidal pool, okay, oxygen, any gases, oxygen or carbon dioxide, are going to decrease in that tidal pool because the temperature is going up. It's an inverse relationship. And then solubility decreases as salinity increases, it's also inverse. So if I add more salt to the water, there is less room for oxygen to get dissolved in or carbon dioxide or any gas. So the solubility of gases also goes down with, if you increase salinity, okay? So temperature and salinity increase are, are gonna cause a decrease in gases. And then density. Density is equal to mass divided by volume, DMV, like Department of Motor Vehicles. That's how I always remembered it. Lower temperature increases density. So the colder it gets, the until it freezes, the colder it gets, the more it's going to sink. So cold water, liquid water, will sink. Um, and warm water, oppositely, will rise. Just like warm air rises and cool air sinks. 
<clears throat> solid water obviously is less dense than liquid. We know that's important. We're going to talk more about that in the future. And the more saline it is, the more dense it is. So the saltier the water, it's going to have more stuff in it. So it's going to have more atoms in the same amount of volume. And so it's going to sink. So salt water also sinks uh, faster than fresh water. And then finally, specific heat capacity. Um, water has this amazing ability to hold on to heat more than other things. It takes a lot more heat to make water change its temperature. Think about this. I put a pot on the stove, right? After a minute, a pot with nothing in it, right? I heat it up. After one minute, can I touch that pot? Of course not. You're going to burn your finger, right? You'd be foolish to do that. However, if I fill the pot with water and I did the same thing, I turned it on, turned the stove on on high for one minute. Could I go back to that pot and, and put my fingers in the water after one minute? Sure I could. It's just going to be warm. It's not going to be boiling yet because water takes, has a high specific heat. It takes a lot more energy to raise the temperature or lower the temperature for that matter. Um, a lot more time to lower the temperature, to cool off, I should say, um, than even metals. I could take a piece of aluminum foil, put it in the stove at 500 degrees, take it out, and after like 10 seconds, I could touch the aluminum foil because it has a low specific heat. Water would, would hold on to that heat, okay? And if you missed anything on that slide, um, if you missed the little uh, thing you had to do over here, please go back to it. Um, just fast forward to uh, this time frame for that slide, slide uh, 13, and um, finish that later. Or copy from a neighbor. That's fine, too. So this is a review, solute, solvent, solution, and solubility. Okay? So the solute is the salt, for example. It's the thing that dissolves in something else. The solvent is the thing, this water, in this case, in our, in our reference. Um, water will, is the universal solvent, so that's one way to remember it. Um, that's the thing that dissolves other things, like salt and sugar, or calcium carbonate, or oxygen, okay? A solution is when the two are mixed together. When you take the solute and the solvent, you've got this homogeneous mixture. Homo means the same, so everything is the same everywhere. Um, if, if I had a beaker, and it, if I took a sample from here and a sample from here, it would be the same exact thing. That's what homogenous means. And uh, that, a solution. So if I scooped up some seawater, this would be a solution of seawater. It has both solvent and solute in it. And then solubility is the ability, that's the ability, ability, right, to dissolve something. So, or for something to dissolve in something else. So what is the solubility of this liquid? You can say that um, it's able to hold this much solute, okay? So the solubility of water at a certain temperature can hold this much salt or this much sugar. And you make solutions. And the last slide, I believe this is our last slide for today, um, you need to pretty much describe what's happening in this picture, okay? So here you have your solute, the salt, the sodium chloride, and your, sol your solvent, the water, and you are making a solution of salt water. Well, this is what's happening at the microscopic level. Okay, so pay attention here. You've got the um, cation, the positive sodium, kind of being attacked by the negative oxygen portions of the water molecules. And it surrounds it, how did that happen? And it surrounds it and pulls it apart. It's dissociating the ions in the water, spreading them around. And then on the opposite side, the chlorine for the anion, you've got the positive sides of the water molecules locking on and pulling those apart from those. And so in the end, you're going to have a solution. All this salt will be dissolved and um, it'll be homogenous in the end, okay? So that's pretty much what these words say, partially chlorine ion and the partially positive hydrogen and the sodium ion and the partially negative oxygen, okay?
Yep, that is the last slide. So any questions at this point? Um, I will open the floor to those questions.